Hare Krishna devotees, please accept my humble obeisance as all Krishna Shri Prabhupada. Welcome devotees our morning Bhagavatam class. Um, I know we all were really enjoying the kirtan, especially the sweetness of, of a Chuta Gopi's description. But at the same time, I could not um, have Maharaj wait too long. So, but we all were really getting into the groove. I could see that. I can definitely see we were all grooving with it. So thank you for um, enjoying the kirtan. And this, uh, this morning, we will be uh, discussing from Srimad Bhaktam, Canto 1, Chapter 15, Verse 49. And the chapter is entitled, The Pandavas Retired Timely. And we are very happy to have His Holiness Chandramali Swami with us. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to you and all glories to Sri Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. All glories to Sri Prabhupada. All glories to the Vaishnavas. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Vidorapi Prati Prati Yajya. Bhavesa Deham Atmanaham. Krishna Vesena Tachita. Pitrirbi Swa. Jayam Yayo. Translation. Vidura, while on pilgrimage, left his body at Prabhas. Because he was absorbed in thought of Krishna, he was received by the denizens of the Pitriya Loka planet, where he returned to his original post. <clears throat> Purport. The difference between the Pandavas and the Vidura and Vidura is that the Pandavas are eternal associates of the Lord, the personality of Godhead. Where Vidura is one of the administrative demigods is in charge of Pitri Loka and is known as Yamaraj. Men are afraid of Yamaraj because it is only it is he only who awards punishment to the miscreants of the material world. But those who are devotees of the Lord have nothing to fear from him. To the devotees, he is a cordial friend, but to the non-devotees, he is fear personified. As we have already discussed, it is understood that Yamaraj was cursed by Manduka Muni, be degraded as a sudra, and therefore Vidura was an incarnation of Yamaraj. As an eternal servitor of the Lord, he displayed his devotional activities very ardently and lived the life of a pious man, so much so that a materialistic man like Dhritarashtra also got salvation by his instruction. So by his pious activities in the devotional service of the Lord, he was able to always remember the lotus feet of the Lord. And thus he became washed of all contamination of a sudra-born life. At the end, he was again received by the denizens of Pitraloka and posted in his original position. The demigods are also associates of the Lord without personal touch, whereas the direct associates of the Lord are in constant personal touch with him. The Lord and his personal associates incarnate in many universes without cessation. The Lord remembers them all, whereas the associates forget due to their being very minute parts and particles of the Lord. They are apt to forget such incidents due to being infinitesimal. This is corroborated in Bhagavad Gita 4.5. Om Vigyan Timirandasya Gina Jana Salakaya Taksun militam yena tirtas mai shi guravena maha. Maum Vishnu padaya Krishna prastaya bhutale shi makti bhakti vedanta swami nitravadi. Namaste jari prati deve vengavani pichari. Nirvase sasun yavari pasyat yare pitarine. Panchakalpa guru vis chapi ba sindhu devicha. Titanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasudhi Oda Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare 
Hari Rama, Hari Rama, 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 Hari Hari. So we're hearing a little bit about an incident in the life of Yamaraj. He uh, apparently misjudged or misunderstood a situation and he gave a punishment to this Mandaka Muni, which Mandaka Muni felt was unfair and not at all done understanding the situation. And therefore, Yamaraj was cursed. He was cursed to be born as a Sudra. And so that's now what we know as Vidura, one of the, the actual younger brother of Vidarashtra, who was a very prominent person during the intrigue of the Battle of Kurukshetra. In fact, it was Vidura that saved the life of the Pandavas when Diodana wanted to, well, he had many plans to destroy them. And one of the plans was to send them to a house. This house was made out of lac. And the idea was they would go there and live there. And then once they were lived there, they the house would be set on fire and lac burns immediately. And so they would have no chance to escape. But the Vudura knew the intrigue of Duryodhana and warned the Pandavas. And therefore, although they accepted Duryodhana's invitation, they dug a tunnel underneath the ground. And then they escaped through the tunnel. And when the house was burned, they were already had gone. <laughs> So this is Vidura, and he was always he always understood the position of the Pandas and Krishna as being the great devotees, and therefore he protected them. But at the same time, he was always enthusiastic and in a very direct way to try to save his older brother Dhritarashtra. It was because of Vidura's constant and persistent preaching to Dhritarashtra that Dhritarashtra finally detached himself from his family situation, left everything along with his wife Gandhari, went to the forest, performed austerities and penances, purified themselves and actually became liberated and uh, left the body in that state. And this was Vidura. So this is Yamaraj come again the Yamaraj we all know about, the Yamaraj, um, as Prabhupada wants to point out clearly here, um, the miscreants and non-devotees, they fear him very strongly. We have the example of um, Ajamil. When Ajamil was at the very end of his life, he called out to his son, Narayan, in order to get free in order to call his son to save him as he saw the Yamadudas coming. And when he called, of course, he called the name of the Lord Narayan in such a helpless and pure state, called the Namabas, not in pure Nam. And he was freed from the reactions of getting all of his sinful activities manifested and being dragged to Yamaloka and then punished in different ways, as described in the fifth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, we read that fifth canto, the very end of the fifth canto, describes the 28 hells that are there where the living entity who lives under the control of the material energy, in other words, those who don't take up devotional service, those who live for sense gratification and material prosperity, they are forced to see the, this agents of death at the time of their death, and uh, they are dragged. It's described, these agents are very fierce looking. They're quite horrible looking. They carry various types of ropes and other devices to tie up the conditioned soul and drag him drag his subtle body to Yamaraj after he leaves the body. So sometimes people think, well, this is a nice uh, 
you know, cartoon or something like that. But these, 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 you know, these uh, um, um, Yamadutas, who are agents of Yamaraj, are real individuals. And there, there was one devotee in our movement. This was back in the early days. Uh, his father was quite a, uh, what well, you might say, a materialistic person. So much so that one of the things he loved to do was hunting animals. So at the end of his life, he was quite sick, suffering. And um, at one point, death arrived. And then death arrived, he called out in a very helpless and loud voice, bring my gun, bring my gun. He was seeing these uh, horrible creatures coming to pull him away. And this was described by the man's wife, who was the mother of this devotee. And uh, so at the time of death, he saw these uh, personalities come. And there's many other incidences also, too, where devotees have been around non-devotees in hospitals. And um, when time of death comes, they go through a very horrible experience, if they're conscious, that is. And then what they're seeing are these personalities. So Yamaraj has a very, um, what we say, difficult service where he has to punish the living entities. So although he got cursed to take birth as Vidura, he found it a great opportunity to preach Krishna consciousness and play the role of someone who was actually trying to help the conditioned souls in their sojourn by preaching Krishna consciousness. And he became the famous Vidura. And you can, if you read the Srimad Bhagavatam, there's beautiful discussions between Vidura, Vidura and Maitreya on the principles of pure devotional service. So, but he is Yamaraj, and he is also one of the Mahajans, Mahajano Yena Katasapanta, that Yamaraj is one of the proponents of transcendental religious principles. There are 12 persons who are authorized to teach the path of pure devotional service. Brahma, Shiva, Narada, Pallad, the four Kumaras, Bhishma Dev, Janaka, Bali Maharaj, Yamaraj, and let's see, Vayambhuva Manu, uh, that's 10. There's 12 altogether. And of these 12 personalities are authorized. So they teach the plastic pure devotional service. The Yamaraj is also one. But his service to the Lord is to, somebody has to do this dirty service of punishing the conditioned souls. So he is designated as that. There's one story in the Mahabharata which describes how when the Pandavas were in the forest and uh, at one point they had no water and they were really feeling the uh, grip of thirst. So one by one, they went out to look for water. First it was Nakul, and Sahadev, and then uh, Bhima, then Arjun, and finally Yudhisthira. Well, as one was not coming back, another was coming. So why were they not coming back? Each one had found a lake of beautiful crystal clear water. And each person as they came, when Nakul not, not came, he saw the lake, but rather than going back to tell anybody, because he was so thirsty, he started, he was attempting to drink. And then he heard a voice. The voice was from this very unembodied soul who was a yaksha. And he said, this is my lake. 
You cannot drink that water. If you drink the water, you will die. And so, uh, each one of them, Nukula, Sahade, Bhima, Arjun, they they all they all drank the water and they all died. Now Yudhishthir was the only one left because you know, of course Gandhari uh, Draupadi was also with him. So Yudhishthir went and he came to the lake and he saw the, the dead bodies of his four brothers lying around the lake. They each one had refused to, to uh, submit to this yaksa's command of not drinking the water. The Yamaraj, came, I mean, I'm sorry, Yudhisthira came. And he came and he started to about to drink the water. He said, and he heard that same voice, this is my lake. Don't do not drink the water. If you drink, you will die, just like your brothers. Oh, Yudhisthira stopped, he restrained himself. He says, who are you? He says, I am Dharmaraj, <laughs> and I have some questions for you. If you answer my questions, then I will grant you a boon, anything you want. And Yudhisthira restrained his desire to drink the water. He said, what are your questions? And then he asked him 50 questions, which is part of the Mahabharata. And Yudhisthira was so intelligent and so adept that he was able to answer all of the questions. Two of the questions I can remember. One of them is, and the final question is the message of this particular pastime. One of the questions was, what's more numerous than the blades of grass in all of creation? And what is their answer? The thoughts and the minds of men are more numerous. <laughs> Finally, the last question came and he said, what is the most amazing thing in this world? And then the Amrad and the Unistair answered, and he said, the most amazing thing in this world is everyone is seeing their friends, relatives, and people in general are dying that they're thinking, not going to happen this way. <laughs> that is the most amazing thing in the world. And we hear that statement quite often when we hear different classes. And so after Speaking that, this Yaksha revealed himself. He said, I am your father, Dharmaraj, the Lord of Death. Therefore, you have pleased me so much. Therefore, I give you a benediction. You may get one of your brothers back. So please ask, any one of your brothers will come back to life by my power, only one. So Yudhisthira was thinking, he said, please bring Nakul back to life. This Yaksha, who was Dhammaraj, Yamaraj, he said, Nakul, why have you chosen Nakul? Why haven't you chosen the greatest of all archers, Arjun? You are about to engage in this big, big fight. And therefore, why didn't you choose Arjun? And Yamaraj, I mean, I'm sorry, Yudhisthira, who was also known as Dharma personified, said, well, I am the son of Kunti, and, but, yeah, but Nikul is the son of Madri, both of the same father. Therefore, in order to please Madri, I will all to allow one of Madri's sons to live. I will. I have chosen the cool. And when uh, Damaraj heard that, Yamaraj, he heard that. He said, "You are truly the principle of religion. Therefore, because you have chosen in that way, I 
I give you all of your brothers back to life again. And they all came back to life and they didn't even realize they had died. <laughs> and they looked around and they, it was just like they had waken up from some sleep. So this is a story how Yamaraj performs many of his activities for the benefits of the conditioned soul. But he has a very, uh, what we say, undesirable service. He has to punish the conditioned souls for their activities. And sometimes people don't understand that we're responsible. People think, well, yes, we are responsible, so therefore we take birth. And then we get another birth after that. We leave the world and we get reborn. And we have to take another birth. But for those who are sinful, they have to see Yamaraj. And it's described in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the fifth, every end of the fifth canto, how horrible the living entity has to suffer according to the nature of their sinful activities. And this is not some imagination. <laughs> Sometimes people think the scriptures are eulogies, some um, hyperboles, exaggerations. Uh, they actually are factual accounts of what is about to happen to the conditioned souls if they do not become at least pious and ultimately Krishna conscious. So those who are sinful have to go to meet the Lord of death. So here we're hearing a little bit about him. Now it explains how he, he departed his body. And um, now he is going back to his position as Yamaraj. He, he uh, lives in a place called Pitriyaloka. That's his original position. It's... Um, one of the manifested planets, I believe, below the earth. <laughs> but it's a very luxurious planet. So it says here that the personal associates of the Lord, they live with the Lord in many universes. And then the Lord remembers them all. But the associations, the associates, they forget this is due to our so one of the, the, the constant characteristics, or I might say outstanding characteristic of the conditioned soul, and is quite prominent, is forgetfulness. We have a tendency to forget all the time, especially the most important thing, and that is our relationship with Krishna, which is eternal and never and always the most complete and satisfying relationship that one can attain to because it is our natural constitutional position to serve the Lord with devotion. So here is a little incident to get help remind the condition so not to be subjected by forgetfulness. So you might say, well, it comes by its own accord. How can we overcome forgetfulness? By practicing Krishna consciousness, our minds become clear. And forgetfulness starts to fall in the background, even in ordinary activities. Well, not ordinary, but day-to-day -day devotional activity. The Lord will help the devotee always remember as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Savasya Chahamradi Sani Vasto, Matat Smita Gyanama Pohanam Cha. You want remembrance? I give it. You want forgetfulness? I forgive it. You want uh, uh, remembrance, forgetfulness? And if you want to, uh, what's the third one? We got the third one. Knowledge. Knowledge, yeah. If you want knowledge, I also give you that. So everything comes from Krishna. So if we engage in devotional service, Krishna helps us to remember what we need to remember, and at the same time, he reminds us to remember himself. 
So when we chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, we have to remember Krishna. It's not that we have to be put into a difficult situation in order to remember Krishna. These difficult situations in life that we experience are ways that Krishna allows, I didn't say he does it, but he allows it to happen. So it's an impetus for us to remember Krishna. And that is the perfection. As the scriptures say, there are only two injunctions. Although there are 64 injunctions that are mentioned in the nectar of devotion, two become the principle by which all of the other 62 become automatically um, uh, attained to. In other words, if one remembers, if one practices the first two, all of the other 62 come automatically. And what is that? One should always, satatam, remember Krishna, and one should never forget Krishna. So these two things are mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam and also in the Chaitanya Charitamrita as the essence of the practice of Krishna Kani. Always remember Krishna, never forget Krishna. And forgetfulness of Krishna, as it says in the uh, Padma Purana, it talks about what is the forgetfulness of Krishna, what is the nature of that forgetfulness. It says that at first it poses the question, the verse says, what is the greatest anomaly? What is the greatest misfortune? What is the greatest mistake? And then, and then it answers the question in the same verse, to forget the Supreme Personality of Godhead, even for one moment. <laughs> so this is, if we can practice our Krishna consciousness in such a way as that we remember Krishna always, we will always be in the best position to receive the mercy of the Lord and ultimately and will be completely free from all the miseries of material existence. That is the benefit of remembering Krishna always. And Krishna is so nice, as we were hearing just as the introduction to this class was being narrated, uh, how just hearing about Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan and the intricacies of how he, ex he displays his pastimes, devotees become attracted to Krishna. He goes to bed at night, sleeps for 24 hours, wakes, tw I'm sorry, 24 minutes. We sleep for 24 hours. He sleeps for 24 minutes. He, he gets up and he sneaks out the window and then Radharani is aware that Krishna is waiting for her. So she, then she performs her um, little drama of getting away from her mother, her mother-in-law, Kutila, Jatila, mother-in-law, sister-in-law. And then she, then they meet together. And that is the perfection of, of all activities to bring Radha and Krishna together. So one who hears about these pastimes of how Radha and Krishna are being arranged in such a way that as they meet each other, this is the highest expression of loving devotion. The devotees find great happiness and hearing how Krishna and Radharani come together, not only do they become happy, but they become satisfied knowing that Krishna and Radharani are experiencing their happy, the highest happiness that they can experience by being together. And that is the perfection of Krishna consciousness to, to celebrate Krishna and Radharani coming together. There's no greater celebration. And that is done when we chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hela Prabhupada Ki Jai. Thank you so much, Marjo. Such a wonderful class. Um, I, I really like how you concluded the point of never forgetting Krishna, because in this crazy material world, there are always reasons that will make us <laughs> forget the Lord, 
and think that we are the controls and then we go crazy. So um, thank you so much, Marsh, for concluding that amazing point. Um, yes, Ileana, go ahead. I think I got your name right, although your name is not on the screen. But go ahead with your question. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Hare Bol. Uh, please accept my humble obedience. All glories uh, to you, all glories to Sheila Braupat. Um, I have uh, three questions. Um, can you explain uh, the difference uh, uh, between uh, Visura and Yamaraj? And um, um, does uh, uh, only the Lord uh, uh, and um, uh, his direct uh, associates uh, with uh, a personal contact uh, um, continuously incarnate in uh, many universe? Uh, Anasuya, can you bring up the uh, the screen with all the devotees on there? <laughs> oh, yes, Marge. Um, Manoharini, can you start the share screen? Thank okay, you. here you go. Okay. Um, the first question is the difference between Vidura and Yamaraj is no difference. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Yamaraj incarnated or was forced to take birth as Vidura. Same personality. And the second question is, can you repeat? Okay. Um, does uh, uh, only the Lord and uh, his direct uh, associate uh, uh, with a personal contact with uh, the Lord uh, con um, continuously uh, incarnate in uh, many universes? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's explained that as Krishna performs his pastimes in one universe and when he winds them up, he brings his pastimes to another universe. There's a, there, the pastimes are essentially the same, but details are different. So as he goes from one universe to another, he displays his battle Kurushetra is there. Krishna's appearance in the world is there. All of these things that we hear in the Bhagavatam are there, but the details of those particular pastimes are slightly changed from universe to universe. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the, the three, the, the three question, um, Yamaraj at the moment of the the death uh, sends his uh, servant the Yamadutas. Uh, it's it's true, no? Uh, but uh, are uh, there are cases uh, in uh, which uh, he intervenes directly? Uh, we don't know too many of uh, uh, intervenes directly, but he does do that in certain cases. But uh, we. I can't think of any particular where he intervenes and uh, takes over. He lets his um, devotees, his followers, do the work, and then he gives out the punishment. He is like a judge. <laughs> okay. And mm -hmm. and who are the Yamadutas? You don't want to know. <laughs> There's pictures of them in the Canto or Srimad Bhagavatam, they are personalities who have the service of bringing the conditioned souls to Yamaraj. They are very fierce looking. Um, they carry with them ropes, tie up the conditioned soul, and drag them to Yamaraj. You don't want them at the time of death. <laughs> There's only for those who are sinful. Okay. That's why when people die, they sometimes they scream or they go through frightful experiences because they're seeing the Yamadudas at that time. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Yeah, but they don't touch the devotees because Yamaraj has warned them that for my devotees, you don't go. 
The devotee of Krishna, you stay away. Thank you, Ileana. Nice question. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes, Raj Prabhu, go ahead. Thank you. Raj, please can you explain what is the difference between always remember Krishna and never forget him? Well, you have to remember not to forget, and you have to forget not to re you have to forget to re not to remember. So, in other words, remember those things. That, remember Krishna always, and forget those things that are not of Krishna. <laughs> So forgetfulness should be there towards anything outside of Krishna. And remembrance should be there for everything connected to Krishna. So sometimes we say you have to remember not to forget, and you have to forget not to remember. Blows my mind's part. <laughs> you have to, in other words, remember Krishna and forget everything else. <laughs> it's not like you remember Krishna and then you remember everything else, too. No. Everything that takes you away from Krishna is ultimately everything comes from Krishna, is connected yeah. to Krishna. Basically, everything does take you away from Krishna, so that's why the statement is there. Okay, Maharaj. He, that's why we put pictures all over our walls. And then help us remember Krishna. We put, we, sometimes we put verses we paste them in different places in our, in our room and in our house. Somehow remember Krishna. I think I need pictures on the inside of my glasses. Yeah, that you have some on the inside? No, I think I need some. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's nothing to see out there. It's all what it is. Except for you, Maharaj. No, I'm included in the forgetfulness pack. <laughs> Don't tell me that, Maharaj. Well, you know, you know, that's a good idea. Maybe you should, maybe, oh, all right, I have a nice service. Start manufacturing, become an optometrist, and then give people prescriptions on their glasses with Krishna's picture on the inside. Mm -hmm. That's, do I have to do that, Maharaj? Yeah, that would be good. You do a great service. And you get paid for it, too. They would probably give you extra money. Mm -hmm. Well, you can money. disobey the orders of the switcher master. <laughs> I guess I could try. That's the third offense. <laughs> I'm not sure how many, how many people would buy them. I say, what's this? I can't see properly. No, you're seeing properly now. Before you couldn't see. Properly. Yes. They might punch me, though, Maharaj. All right. So, anyway, at least follow yourself anyway. That's the important thing. Remembering Krishna is not hard. And someone, Prabhupada, said, I cannot. I can't even re not remember Krishna. Probably said there was never a time I wasn't thinking of Krishna. But then you might say, well, that's Shiva Prabhupada, but we can also practice them. We're seeing some of the devotees who don't put their pictures up. They have pictures like of Srimati Radharani, 
I'm seeing a picture of Krishna and Yasoda together. I'm seeing a picture of Krishna's lotus feet. I'm seeing a picture of Prabhupada. Just by looking at the screen here, I'm seeing pictures, nice pictures. Raj Prabhu, your questions, I have to say, is so good because at the end, you bring humor into it and it's nice and I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> we, need a, we need some Krishna conscious humor once in a while to make sure that we are awake. So thank you so much, Prabhu. Thank you. Yes, Mother Sri Devi, go ahead. Thank you, Anasuya. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances or glories to Srila Prabhupada. Guru Maharaj, this uh, graphic description of the Yamadutas and how they take away, you know, the souls that are inimical to devotional service has me thinking. Um, you said those who are simply materialistic, engaged in only sense gratification and economic development are dragged to hell. So my question is, what happens to those souls who are not engaged in devotional service, but they are not sinful either? They are somewhat pious. They definitely know there is a higher power, but they are not clear about whom to worship. Either they worship demigods or they worship some, you know, pitris or something. They do admit to a higher power, but they're not clear about whom to worship? What happens to them? Well, you know, it's interesting because that question is a very complex, there's an answer that's quite complex to that. First of all, as it says in the scriptures and also all quite often by the Acharyas, that the sinful are dragged to Yamaraj, those who are sinful. Now, it's also understood that anyone who engages in material activities will automatically commit sin. Can't help it. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last word. It's automatically? Commit sins. Automatically. Right. Yeah, even those who are pious. We have the example of, uh, of um, King Nirga, very pious person. But he made a little mistake on his karma kanda, and because of that, he had to take birth as a lizard. So the material energy is so constituted that one cannot simply perform just pious activity. And therefore, the motive, who who who's actually situated in the pure and pure goodness, or in the in the mode of goodness perfectly, very few because. The way the world is, passion and ignorance are more prominent, and they're always taking good, always taking goodness over. So, although a person is pious and they live a pious life, if they commit some sinful activities, they may have to go to Yamaraj for some small portion of that reaction. And so everything's in proportion, you know. So therefore, Prabhupada used to say, pious and impious, it's also impious. Because it takes one away from the actual goal of life is to worship the Supreme Personality of God. In. But those in, who are pious, religious to some degree, they may not have to ex experience so much suffering. We have the example of Mandukya Muni in this particular pastime. It's interesting because it illustrates what was Mandukya Muni, why did he curse Yamaraj? That story wasn't explained in the purport, but it mentions that uh, when uh, Mm -hmm. There were some thieves that uh, were uh, 
committing a thief, uh, some theft, and they were running from the authorities and they hid in the ashram of Manduka Muni. And when, when the police came, they arrested not only the thieves, but Manduka Muni also. And then there was a punishment and uh, Manduka Muni was sentenced to die by sh by uh, shul. It's a, I won't describe that particular form of death. It's quite horrible. Uh, but uh, mm, Manduka Muni was thinking, what is this? I didn't do anything. And now I'm I'm being I'm being sentenced to death and to be tortured to death. So he went to Yamaraj. He had the power. He says, Yamaraj, why are you punishing me like this? And Yamaraj said, well, when you were a little boy, you took a straw, piece of straw, and you pierced an ant with that straw, and the ant died. And Manduka Muni said, well, you know, I was just a little child. That was an innocent act. And then Manduka Muni got angry and cursed. He said, you're not qualified to give judgment. Therefore, you should fall to the material world and take a birth as a sutra. Uh, and he was powerful enough to do that. So here's an example of how even slight amounts of sinful activities done at any time during one's life, if one doesn't take the devotional server, that reaction comes in one form or another. So one has to understand that, that this material world is so constituted, it's very natural and easy to commit sinful activities. But unless one takes the devotional service, they have to suffer. And if they take the devotional service by the power of devotional service, they can become freed from the reactions of their sinful activities. We have the example of Yam and Ajamil. That is the power of devotional service. It frees one for all the reactions of sinful activity. So it's easy to commit sinful activities. People do it all the time, even good people. <laughs> that was a powerful question, Shri Devi. Yeah, very, very clear and uh, beautiful explanation. Now it makes it so understandable how urgent, how imperative it is to engage in devotional service. Even a little bit will save one. But not doing devotional service is extremely dangerous for the living in. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you for asking that question, Sri Devi. Thank you. Yes, uh, Prakshad, go ahead. Thank you, Sri Maharaj. Please accept my whole obeisances. All glories to you and all glories to Sri Prabhupada. I, I'll ask the question, even though when you were answering the last question, you answered part of what I was going to you know, ask about the people who are. Um, well, let me just start with the question, because I know two people who are in that situation, two different situations. One of them um, is interested in Krishna consciousness now. You know, uh, you know and um, one thing that's happened to him is that his wife is not so interested in Krishna consciousness. The reason being that he said she said that she was raised in a religious family and she was religion, religious statements were used to threaten her about hell and those things. So she got turned off when she got older. And um, now this is the guy's wife now. So she got uh, turned off when she got older. And she's made her mind up that. She's just going to be a good person. She's going to do pious acts, but she doesn't want to go to any religion and definitely does not want to come to Krishna consciousness because she sees that also as another organized religion. And the organized religions are all, you know, one way or the other, they're going to give you some threats. And so this guy is not getting much 
of any support from her. And so she's not that you know, consistent in coming around. Um, so my question is how to help this particular wife with mm -hmm. her thoughts. Well, she doesn't have to join any institution nor follow any principles. All she has to do is say, just chant the holy names of the Lord. That's all. You can do it anytime, any place. Required rules, regulations. If she does that, then she's actually engaging in devotional service. But it seems it, it, there's not, there'll be no re requirements placed upon her. This chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. <laughs> she should chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Tell her this is a very nice sound vibration and, and relieves all of your, your stress and all of your anxiety. This chant, these are names of God. That's it. You don't have to go to the temple. You don't have to do anything else. Just chant it. Okay. Okay. Let's get it started anyway. And once she starts chanting, then things will change. Mm. But, you know, because she's averse to any kind of institution and all the rules that come with it, then, you know, just chant. That's it. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much. Second question is not necessary because we've already answered it uh, today with the people who are thinking they're just going to be pious, but they don't they don't follow any religion. They don't believe in God. So you already answered that part. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. My obeisance is, I hope you're feeling better. Getting better slowly. Slowly. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yes, Raj Prabhu, go with the uh, go with the question. Please add some humor if you can, Prabhu. <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mother Sri Devi has got me thinking about something that I think about a lot. And it is, and as we're on the subject, what is the situation at the time of death if somebody is attempting to become a devotee, trying to engage in all of the activities that a devotee is in, normally is engaged in, but is not yet initiated. What is the question? Uh, so say if someone is, I'm just talking about myself, let's <laughs> Trying to engage in all the all the all the uh, all the aspects of devotional service each and every day, trying to act in the manner of taking the lead of senior devotees, but uh, just trying to be a devotee but not initiated yet. So if I were to die today or tomorrow, would Yamaraj come and try and drag me away, or the Yamadutas come and try and drag me away with their ropes? No, you have the example of the Hajimil. He wasn't initiated. He wasn't practicing anything, but he, chan he chanted without offense the holy name of Lord Narayan. He was free from all of his sinful activities. And therefore, when the Vishnu Dudas came, they defeated the Yama Dudas in discussion, saying, this man is, is pious. He's, uh, he's free from your influence because he's chanted the name of the holy, the holy name of the Lord. So initiation is the third step on the nine step process of bhakti. First two steps, you're still practicing. You're entering into the, the mood of bhakti. Only when you take the uh, initiation, you get extra mercy to practice and uh, relieve yourself of the uh, unwanted things that block your progress. But before then, you're still making progress simply by chanting, by associating, reading the books. All that is, is building. So you're not under the influence of uh, uh, Yamaraj's men. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Nobody wants that that particular service anyway. <laughs> so 
but there are people who get it. So. Thank you, Marge. It was such a wonderful class. And actually, I would like to ask devotees if there are any other questions, anything that's coming to your mind, anything that you need clarification on, please do unmute yourself. Yes, Srinivas Prabhu, go ahead. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, nice to see you again. Dhanavad Pranams. Please accept Whoa. my uh, obeisances. Uh, Maharaj, uh, you mentioned about Satatam Kirtan and Toma, uh, right? You know, for grahasas <laughs> like that, you know, we work from nine to five. When I get into the job, it's very difficult to think about anything else. You now I do, you know, 16 rounds and those type of things, but, you know, out of this nine to five, you know, now we have to go to the office, uh, you know, uh, you know, they are mandatory. But how do we improve our Krishna consciousness? Because it's it's very difficult to always create, think about Krishna, you know, during the office time. There was one devotee, his name was Ramaniya, and he gave a whole seminar. He spent 28 years in the, in the workplace as a devotee. And he gave, he gave us a little insight on how he lived his life in the workplace, which was he he was very uh, intelligently organized his time, where he could uh, do certain spiritual things even while he was in the workplace. Um, there's a there's a text that is written by him, which I have a copy of, and I'm sending. Anybody who wants it, how to practice Krishna consciousness in the workplace. And you might see what you can use, you can glean certain things from it and apply it. But anything we can do to improve our, our remembrance of Krishna, we want we want to take advantage of that. That's why sometimes when devotees are put into difficult situations, they thank the Lord because it's a great opportunity for remembering the Lord. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Maharaj. If, uh, if you could get a copy of the documentation, you know, we will definitely go through that and see, try to implement it. Thank you so much, Hare Krishna. I'll send the copy to Anasuya, and then she can make anybody who wants to uh, get a copy, they can contact her. Is that Thank okay? You. No problem, Marge. Yes, the, that, that's fine. Completely fine. Yes. And I will share my email address in the chat so that those that don't have it, you can contact me and I will be happy to um, uh, share with you the, the document. Okay. Um, yes, Raj Prabhu, go ahead. No, we got we got Silpesh. Raj can sit back. Oh, Silpesh. Sorry. That's right. Silpesh Prabhu. Go ahead. Hare uh, Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Um, mm -hmm. I've got a question. If, if we have been judged by you and we've taken the punishment, whatever, maybe go to Elish planet or whatever, then does that mean that karma is nullified or does that karma still carry on in another birth? Yeah, that, that, uh, that punishment is the, is the reactions of the karma. So it's being is being nullified. That's why sometimes devotees, when they're leaving the body, they don't want any kind of pain relievers or any kind of uh, you know drugs. They want to go through that suffering to purify themselves from any any residual reactions that may still be there. So yeah, suffering that burns up the act the, the reactions. And, and the, why? the suffering is also committed, concommitted in relationship to the type of severity of the sin. I mean, if you if one has committed a murder, then the only re, the only way one can be free from the reactions of that is to sacrifice their own life. <laughs> in, in the in the in the arena of punishment. Like that. So yeah, every sin has its concommitted suffering amount. <laughs> and of course, if you involve other people in the sinful activities you committed, then you're you're gonna get a greater reaction to that sin. 
So are all our sins not judged by Yamraj first, or are things just carried on into the next birth automatically? Not for a devotee, for the Lisa for the non devotee. Right. Yeah, it's complicated, all this karma and punishment. There's a lot to it. Yeah, Krishna says in the Krishna says in one place that the intricacies of karma is too difficult to explain, too complex to explain. It's like there's four kinds of karma. And this was given by uh, one devotee who did research on the nature of karma. There's instant karma. There is mass karma. There is uh, manifest karma. And there is one more. I think it's situation karma, something like that. The name is a little different. So how do you know why do you, why do you take birth in a certain family with a certain set of circumstances? All of them. <clears throat> that means certain karma has built up to a certain thing, and it manifests. That's called manifest karma. So situation karma builds up when you get certain amounts of situation karma then you're preparing yourself for the type of birth that you will receive in the next life. This is all within the, the realm of uh, the three modes of material nature, not for the world. Uh, should we give breakfast to Rayos? Yeah, for him, yeah. Yeah. Feed him. Yeah, right away. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, I mean, don't try to figure out karma. You can't. But instant karma, you can figure it out. Instant karma is if you say something nasty to someone and you they say something nasty back to you, that's instant karma. <laughs> if you do something good for someone, someone might do something good for you right away. That's instant karma. Something, in other words, immediate reaction to the activity, that's called instant karma, whether it's auspicious or inauspicious. I mean, some, sometimes we see karma coming back very quickly within a matter of months. You know, you see somebody's done something and they said you can yeah. see there was a very short period of time. So is that still like instant karma? Yeah, you're driving along the highway and you cut off somebody and while you're driving and then uh, while well, a few minutes later somebody cuts you off and, and you start complaining about that guy, but you forgot you just cut somebody else off. <laughs> thank you, Mark. And thank you for replying to my really looking forward to I see I, I use that example as a personal example. I've seen that happen. When I acted wrongly, like driving, I see the same thing happening to me coming from the outside. It happened. Yeah, the laws of karma are so intricate and so so nicely placed that no one can even see it's happening, but it's happening. Thank you, Marge. It's quite helpful. I'm sure I'll have more questions in the future about karma. Uh, just chant Hare Krishna, all your karma will start to dissolve. <laughs> if you chant, you're actually reducing the effects of your karma. Yes. Thank you, Silpesh Prabhu. Uh, Sri Devi, I'm going to take Sukhavah Mataji's question, then I'll come back to you, okay? Go ahead, Sukhavah Prabhu. Sukavaha. Sukavaha. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to your lotus. Uh, Guru Maharaj, regarding the karma, 
So you say that we, when we suffer, the karma goes, but is it something our mental state affect that situation? So if we keep complaining about like we are suffering and suffering, suffering, will that karma may not go and we are doing another karmas or it, still, it, still we can get rid of it? How does that work? Yes, Mike, uh, you're just, you're prolonging the effects of the reaction, that's all. Okay. When you complain about it. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada said, mm -hmm. do not be disturbed by the instrument of your karma. Mm -hmm. If you think that someone is the cause of your suffering, then you get a reaction for that by blaming that person. Oh, Even the person has been put in place by the laws of karma to give you your reaction. So they're just they're just another person that's being as part of the the whole chain. The, mm -hmm. the, 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 the reason is is because of your own activities. The, but you're getting the you're getting that. And you're getting the results of your activity through an instrument. That's why Prabhupada said, do not become disturbed by the instrument of your karma. So an instrument is one that acts on behalf of something. So how should we react? Like if, if we will get hurt, if suppose someone is doing something, how do we react to that? How do we, we should not react at all. We should just accept it. We should try to understand why it's happening. What have I done? Why is Krishna putting me in this situation? What have I done? How can I benefit from this? I can, how can I get relief from the, from the suffering? In other words, you, you ask Krishna, you pray to Krishna, you start to understand there is a reason why it's happening. Although you may not be able to see the reason. But if you blame the person, then you're actually... That's in, there's a verse. Uh, I think we should pull that verse up. It's, uh, where's Anasuna? Is she there? She went on vacation. Okay. I'm, no, Marge. I'm <laughs> cooking for the tea. I'm sorry, I was just cooking. Um, the verse, Marge, and I'll have Manuharin pull it up. Yes. First, Canto. Mm, boy, this is a tough one to remember. 17th. The 16th or 17th, I think, let's try 116, 23. Mano, try 116, 23, Ma. Yes, Marge. I have a Bhagavatam in front of me, and I'm going to look it up. I'll give you the, I'll give you the exact reference in a minute, yeah. No, it's the 17th chapter. 117. One seventeen twenty-two. One seventeen twenty-two. Who could they uh, I mean honestly you read it? Rajo Rajo Vacha Dharma Bravish Dharma Gyan Dharma Sivrisha Rupadrik Yata Dharma Kritastanam Sucha Kasya Patad Bhavit. Translation The king said, <clears throat> O you who are in the form of a bull, you know the truth of religion, and you are speaking according to the principle that the destination intended for the perpetrator of irreligious acts is also intended for one who identifies the perpetrator. You are no other than the personality of religion. Sri Prabhupada's purport. A devotee's conclusion is that no one is directly responsible for being a benefactor or mischief monger without the sanction of the Lord. Therefore, he does not consider anyone to be directly responsible for such action. But in both the cases, he takes it for granted that either benefit or loss is God sent. And thus it is his grace. In case of benefit, no one will deny that it is God sent. 
but in case of loss or reverses, one becomes doubtful about how the Lord could be so unkind to his devotee as to put him in great difficulty. Jesus Christ was seemingly put into such great difficulty being crucified by the ignorant, but he was never angry at the mischief mongers. That is the way of accepting a thing, either favorable or unfavorable. Thus, for a devotee, the, the identify is equally a sinner, like the mischief monger. By God's grace, the devotee tolerates all reverses. Maharaj Prakshit observed this, and therefore, he could understand that the bull was no other than the personality of religion himself. In other words, a devotee has no suffering at all because so-called suffering is also God's grace for a devotee who sees God in everything. The cow and bull never placed any complaint before the king for being tortured by the personality of Kali. Although everyone lodges such complaints before the state authorities, the extraordinary behavior of the bull made the king conclude that the bull was certainly the personality of religion, for no one else could understand the finer intricacies of the cults of religion. I think that answers the question. <laughs> yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. No one, is, no one is, if you blame the mischief monger, you become equally sinful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very powerful question. An amazing purport. Wow. It's one of those revolutionary type of statements where people need to hear more about it. If you read this the same series of if you go on with the next the next few verses, it becomes more and more clear what mm. is the of suffering. <laughs> Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Yes, Sri Devi, please go ahead. You can bring back the. Uh, mm. Yes, Maharaj. Here, yeah. Bring back the, the, the screen with the devotees. <clears throat> Okay, there you go. Sri Devi. Oh, she was right. We have there. another question. Somehow Sri Devi disappeared. Okay. Yeah, I somehow she's we lost connection with her. Anyone else? Yes, Raj Prabhu, go ahead. Thank you. Uh Marge, yesterday some of us were in uh, uh the Zoom class. And we were having a nice discussion. And there's a question that I wanted to ask you. Uh, can you please explain the, the connection or the relationship between love and with compassion? Love mm -hmm. and compassion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, what what is the difference or what is the relationship between love and compassion yes please well love also contains an element of compassion but when there is no love uh, compassion on its own more or less is an, is an element of love that goes down to those who are in need You know, compassion is directed to those who are uh, in need. So preaching is an element of compassion towards the conditioned soul. The love may not be there, but at least compassion is there, which is a, a somewhat of an indication of an element of, a, of concern, which can also be understood as an increment of love.
Okay. So one can love someone, and when one has love, compassion is included. When one has compassion, love will be included in small elements, maybe even full blown. Depends on the person and persons involved. Okay. You know, just like the pure devotee, he loves all conditioned souls, and therefore he's preaching. Maybe some of us who are preaching, we may not have that same love, but we're still showing compassion to the element of preaching. But greater love is found in those who, who have that, who is who are full in their compassion towards the conditioned soul. Or to anyone. You become compassionate towards your uh, your friends and your family members because there's some relationship there. And that relationship is based on some elements of love to some degree. And so it's it's all in proportion to the relationship that is developed. So what is our relationship with the conditioned souls is that because of our relationship with Krishna, and Krishna wants to give his love to all the conditioned souls, we're acting on his love and acting and trying to give the, the conditioned souls Krishna consciousness. So that is, we're, we're taking Krishna's love and trying to distribute it. So he's the one that's actually the full manifestation of compassion. But we're taking elements of that compassion and acting on his behalf. That's all. But we can also come up to more higher higher forms of compassion. Just like when people sacrifice, Prabhupada also said, he said, our movement will be successful in spreading Krishna consciousness around the world only when the devotees are willing to sacrifice their love, their, their life, or sacrifice their love, sacrifice their life for the benefits of the conditioned soul. He said, then our movement will be completely successful. They're willing to give their life to the conditioned soul, right? then the movement will be spread in no time. So it's all in, it's all in degree. Hey, thank you, Maharaj. Nice question. Amazing question. Sri Devi, you're back. I, I know you had a question and then it was blacked out. So please ask a question. Thank you, Anasuya. Uh, Guru Maharaj, at one point you said that if one commits murder, then the only uh, atonement is that one gives up on life. But every morning we sing this prayer to Tulsi Maharani, Yani Kani Chapa Pani Brahma Hatya Dikani Chatani Tani Pranashanti Pradakshina Pade Pade. And there it said that even circumambulating Tulsi, even the sin of killing a Brahmana is uh, forgiven. So does that mean that the forgiveness is there for the sin, but one still has to pay for taking that life? Now, I don't think you got my point. It's so clear, the difference between the devotees and the non-devotees. Oh, sorry. That murder reaction is for the non-devotees, not for the devotees. Well, any kind of sin is there for crime committed by the non devotees The devotees are practicing Krishna consciousness. I'll give you a, a statement by Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, you may have been a murderer in your last life, and now you come to Krishna consciousness. Therefore, you cut your fingers. We minimize, we minimize the reactions of such severe sins by practicing Krishna consciousness. And when you're full in Krishna consciousness, there's no more reactions. Yes, Guru Maharaj, very sorry. Yes, now it is clear to me. If you live inside the jail, you follow the rules of the jail. If you live outside of the jail, you follow the rules of the, the, the state.
Thank you, Maharaj. And thank you for that clarification to Shri Devi. Anyone else? Yes, Raj Prabhu, you have your mic yeah. on. Do you, do you have a question to ask, Prabhu? Uh, that's spooky. Mm -hmm. I was only formulating a question in my head and you're just asking me. Uh, I want to. Sorry. Go ahead, continue. Okay. Sometimes I wonder if does everything that happened at every moment is it good? Is there always a reason from is there always a reason behind that, whether it's good or bad or indifferent? Does everything happen? Is that always is that always Krishna's plan? Not Krishna's plan, not necessarily. It gives you your independence. Krishna's plan is that he wants you to go back to Godhead. That's Krishna's plan. Whatever else you do and it happens, that's your plan. <laughs> Not him. When we do something, uh, say we do something wrong, isn't there something that happens that's trying to teach us a lesson? Or is yeah. Wrong? yeah. The, law, the laws of the Tirana, if you like that. If you're inside the prison, you break one of the laws of the prison, you're, you're going to get a reaction by the prison, by the prison authority. As long as you're under the three modes of material and then nature, you're acting and reacting constantly. It's not Krishna. Krishna is not involved in that one. The only thing he does, he sets up the prison house. Okay. But there's still a lesson to be learned. Prabhupada answered that question. He said, Krishna, mm -hmm. Krishna wants you to go back to Godhead and become develop love, love for him. Everything else that you do, it's not his, it's not his will. It's uh, your, your misuse of your independence. That's right. Mm -hmm. okay. So say you're like trying to engage in devotional service. And and you keep getting all sorts of interruptions, external interruptions. And it means you're, it means you're not serious. Okay. Because you're being interrupted, that means you're not serious. If you were serious, you wouldn't get interrupted. Wow. Sit there and chant your Gayatri. And you start thinking about something, people will come up and start talking to you. And you're thinking, why are they talking? Because you were thinking about something else. If you sit there, chant your Gayatri, and you're absorbed in your Gayatri, you'll never, you, you won't, nobody will say anything to you at any time. Same oh. with the chant of the Hare Krishna mantra. Because we're not serious or we're not attentive to what we're doing, you know, we get, a, we get interrupted. Oh, that's that's really helpful. I've always wondered why sometimes it goes so nicely and sometimes it all's getting getting interrupted. But that, that's that's very powerful, Maharaj. Thank you. Baba said, Maya is as strong as you are weak. But for those who are strong, there's no Maya. Mm. So you have to fortify your desire in Krishna consciousness by sadhu sangha. That is where you get your strength from. Associating with devotees, serving devotees, chanting the holy names. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Maharaj. We will. Thank you so much, Raj Prabhu. This this chapter, this this purport has really stirred up an amazing bunch of questions, and um, I know it's definitely a, a, a awakening, root of awakening, as we say. You know that makes us check ourselves, how focused we are in what we do. So thank you so much for all these wonderful questions, Marge. Um, would you like to end with the round of chanting, or do you have something planned? 
Well, yeah, there's, uh, they're knocking on my door to try to give me breakfast here. So. Oh, Marsh, we took so much of, oh my God, now 9.30. I keep forgetting that you're in America. I'm so sorry, Marsh. <laughs> You've passed your breakfast time, oh Krishna Chaitanya. I don't mind. No, it's okay. This this is nourishment being here, but I think we sufficiently turned in the ocean of questions. If we would just reflect on what we discussed, there'd be a lot of lot more realizations. Mm -hmm. Especially Mars, the verse that you shared, one seventeen twenty two. It's really powerful. Yeah, that, that I think uh, that one that one's a bomb. Most people don't even <laughs> want to read. Marsh, I'm glad you said bomb because I was gonna say something, but yeah, it is a bomb, all right. Just drop right on the head. Yeah, read that whole section and then continue with that from that verse onward. Really. And we are literally like like two chapters away from that. We would be almost close to the ending 15, and then we'll go to 16, and then 17. Hare Krishna is going to be an intense discussion. But, and I'm yeah, sure Marsh will come to the verse again. <laughs> that's powerful. All of the whole series of verses that center around that same topic. Mm. Mm. Amazing. Such wonderful questions. And we thank the devotees for joining us. I think we will let Maharaj have his breakfast. We don't want to get any karma for starving Maharaj not having his breakfast. Maharaj, thank you so much for your time and really giving us your time and answering all the questions. And thank you to all the devotees for, I mean, amazing, amazing, lots of questions. Vancha Krapati Biascha, Kripa Sindhu Bevacha, Patita Nam Bhavane, Bia Vaishnava, Bia Namo Namaha, Srila Prabhupada Ki. Jai. Is Bolinas Chandramani Swami Ki. Jai. 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 Jai.